So we welcome today someone who has uh, grown within our program. Uh, Chandra Pinnock is currently the um, Accessible Technology and Learning Specialist for OTAC. And she supports all of you uh, therapists. As we talk about universal supports, we uh, think about the things that are we already have and the things that are built in that we just really need to know more about how we are using them. And so we're going to start with the tools that are built into the systems that your kids are using. Um, I'm going to say that I'm so proud of Chandra for the uh, for really jumping in with both feet in our program and uh, for now being able to add Echo Ties presenter to her resume. So big picture stuff coming right down to what tools do your kids have right now? I'm going to stop sharing and invite Chandra to start sharing. Thank you all. Great. Good morning, everyone. Can you see my slides? Yes. Fantastic. So um, I'm Chandra Pinnock. Uh, she's already told you I'm the Accessible Technology and Learning Specialist for Oregon Technology Access Program and RSOI. We presented um, a version of this to the Dyslexia International Dyslexia Association uh, workshop. Um, we partnered with them. And so we just decided that it needed to go out to the to the rest of Oregon. So and record it. <laughs> so hopefully you get some good um, tips out of this. So we're here to support access. And in doing so, I want to show you guys how to use the tools that are in the Chromebooks that the kids already have in their hands, as well as some of the accessibility features found in the Chrome browser, which of course, almost all of us use. So first of all, our agenda, we're gonna talk a little bit about accessibility. We're going to talk about the Chromebook first, we're gonna go through text-to-speech features, display a magnification keyboard and text, the cursor and the touchpad, and then audio and captions. Then we'll talk about the Chrome browser. I have some resources to share for you. And then hopefully we'll have some time for some Q&A. There is a ton of information in here, so I'm gonna just kind of dive right in. So first of all, what is access? I think most of you already know what access is, but for those who are watching on YouTube later, maybe, um, for our purposes, it means that a person with a disability can get the same information, engage in it in the same way, and enjoy the same services the same as everyone else. So that means that our kiddos who have difficulties, say dyslexia, they don't have to spend four hours working on the same math homework as their peers. That just doesn't seem fair. <laughs> so accessible educational materials, and this all just kind of flows together, right? The accessible educational materials, those are those materials that the kids can understand. The kids can use to access their education. Sometimes the worksheet just isn't enough. You know, not every kid can pick up their pen and pencil and do their math worksheet. So they need another way. And that's where the accessible educational materials come in. And accessible technology. And what is that exactly? So accessible technology are things that are created with a universal design in mind for a wide range of abilities to use. And 
The important part about this is that we all use it. Everyone does. It's the text to speech or speech to text on our phones that we use or word prediction when we're messaging someone. It's spell check in our emails. Everyone uses accessible technology. And the accessibility features in the Chromebook, on the Chrome browser, in your computers, whether you have a PC or a Mac, these are all built-in tools designed to help us use the technology more effectively. It helps us change our digital environment to suit us so it's easier to read, write, comprehend. Personally, I like my mouse just a little bit bigger and yellow so that I don't lose it on my screen. And why does this matter? And it doesn't just matter to us, but it matters to the kids, it matters to parents, because it helps these kids build confidence. It helps them learn on their own, which they're going to need to do for the rest of their lives. And it allows them self-advocacy for their future, whether that means going on to college or their PhD or whatever work they do in their life. They're going to be learning forever. These tools help them make everything easier. Reducing their frustration makes it easier to read things. It allows them to interact with their computer in the way that they want to, the way that they're comfortable. It makes it easier to get around in the computer. We have auditory aids, visual aids. Again, I really like highlighting and my I do have a tendency to lose my mouse on the screen. I eh, just, everybody's got their thing, right? It addresses their needs and their preferences. So they may need something, but maybe they prefer something. Maybe they prefer their mouse to be purple. Whatever works for them. It makes the... It makes them feel better about what they're doing. And everybody can use it. These tools aren't just for the kids with disabilities, right? They're for everyone. And so they don't have that same um, stigma that they're being set apart. So. I'm going to gloss over this. You guys can look at it later if you'd like to, but the where are the features is kind of important. Um, and feel free to use any of this for whatever reason. This will be helpful if the kids don't know where it is or the teachers don't know where it is. But there's a system menu and the gear icon will bring you to the settings menu where you want to activate this always show accessibility options on the system menu button, and that'll create a shortcut so they can easily go in and turn on and off the accessibility features that they have. Just quick, I love this. And the easy button, so, one of the features of the Chromebook, which is really cool, are the shortcuts. Um, they say that if you learn how to use the keyboard and instead of the mouse and you navigate that way, you increase your productivity significantly. So there are a ton of shortcuts. It's almost its own language in the Chromebook. So to get there, you hit the search button, control S, and that'll pop up the entire shortcut menu, including the accessibilities. So anything that we talk about today, it has a shortcut. 
and you can pull it up in this menu and teach the kids whatever it is that they need or they can teach themselves. So let's get into the actual features. So text-to-speech is the first one. There are several features here. The first one being the Chrome box. Now this is a screen reader for your kiddos that have um, visual impairments. Um, it'll read literally everything on the screen aloud. This will help them be able to navigate their screen. Now, before I get too deep into everything, I just want to put this nugget in your mind that the real power, I think, for these accessibility features is combining certain ones. Um, so it's not really about just finding that one, but I think you'll find that there will be certain combinations that are really going to be your golden ticket, <clears throat> depending on what your kiddo needs. So your Chrome box is your built-in screen reader. Then we have select to speak. So we can highlight specific text and it will read it out loud. And you, so you can focus on just what you want read. It doesn't have to be the entire screen. And then, as I was saying, combined with customized highlighting, it really helps focus and you can use it for learning how to read or focusing on certain parts of what they're reading. But the fun part, which I showed the kiddos and they just had a blast with this was the voice customization. So you can go into your settings and you can choose from all these different uh, languages, uh, accents. You can change the speed and the pitch. And of course, I let the, the kids play with that and, and it was a good time. But the point is that you really want a voice that is comfortable to listen to. So personally, I really like the male Australian accent voice. It's, it's my personal favorite. So moving on to display and magnification. And I, if you guys have Chromebooks available to you, I highly recommend you go in and play with all of these. I can't possibly go over every single uh, feature. So I'm just kind of hitting my favorites. And with that, we have color correction and inversion. So this adjusts your color. It changes the colors of your windows. Um, you can invert the colors. This one, personally, my husband is has red-green color blindness, and that happens to be very common. Um, one in 12 men have that. One in 200 women, and I know that my audience is almost all women, but I did change the colors in these slides specifically because he said he couldn't read it. So we go in here, These the color correction is going to allow you to change the temperature of it, just making it really comfortable for the kiddos to look at. I mean, we spend so much time in front of our computers. Maybe, maybe it's causing them headaches. Maybe... They just really don't like the color purple. Here we can change it and we can make it theirs. So then we have a magnifier. And, you know, I wish that I could like go in and show you this magnifier. Uh, it's so cool. So there's two options. We have one that will magnify the entire screen. It's very basic magnifier, right? It, it just makes everything bigger. But then we have this other magnifier that will 
it it'll put a little box up at the top or the bottom where it'll show the magnified part of the screen. And then the split part of the screen is just regular. So wherever your mouse goes, that's what's gonna show up on the docked magnifier. Very, very cool. So you don't have to lose your screen when you magnify. It's very um, neat. Can I, uh, may I interject something for just a 100%, moment? 100%, yes. Please. I am so glad that we have such a large group with us today, such varied uh, experiences. And, you know, what you're saying about color correction. When I used to teach a, a lab class, I, some kids would come in and the very first thing that they would do would be to change the color of something. And, you know, whenever it was their favorite color, uh, all of a sudden they relaxed and now they were ready for work. Yes. I also want to come in. I'm thrilled that we have Michael Cantino uh, in our oh. group. Today. And no pressure, Chandra. Uh, but when we, <laughs> talk about, when we talk about uh, vision, um, Michael has a comment here about recommending screen readers to sighted students. Um, he doesn't usually. Uh, but Chromevox has a cool speak text under the mouse feature. And so I, I just, at, at this point, I'd love to call on you, Michael, to say, uh, in the, it, um, give us just a little bit more about that, but uh, feel free to interject all along because you know about your population, how some of these tools might be used with your students. Uh, everyone feel free to interject. Sometimes we have a case study, an individual that we talked about, but today we want you to bring your case study or your comments about these tools. So Michael, is there anything that you would like to uh, expound on? Sure, I'll jump in really quickly. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I, can. I don't think I'll jump in too much. Chandra's doing a great job. I, I know she um, is. I'm proud of her. Thank I, you, Michael. No problem. Um, screen readers kind of change the way your computer works a lot of the time. So I don't typically recommend them to sighted students, but Chromebox does have that speak text under mouse feature. A lot of other text-to-speech tools have a similar feature where it's like you hover over text with your mouse and it starts reading. It's one of my favorite text-to-speech tools on, in other programs. Um, and Chromebox doesn't have that built into their normal text-to-speech, or excuse me, the Chromebook. So you can access that speak text on your mouse through Chromebox. So typically I wouldn't tell sighted users turn on Chromebox, but that I really like that speak the text on your mouse feature. Well, what you're talking about is the customization that we all need. Um, and there's no one size fits all. So yes, Chand is doing a great job and thank you. And I am, I was not paying attention to the chat, so I apologize. So Deb, yes, please interject. <laughs> I got your back. Thanks. <laughs> so um, display setting. Uh, I, now, again, I know this is not necessarily students, but I am 44 years old now, and I have some reading glasses, and I'm just saying I find some of these settings very helpful for me. Uh, changing the screen resolution, changing the sharpness, changing the text size, you can do that across the entire computer, or you can do it just in your web pages. Very helpful for me. I like to increase the text size just a tiny bit. Uh, and and as, again, as, Mike, yeah, as Michael was talking about with somebody with vision, but as we tie it over to the, uh, the rest of the group here, we've got a lot of people who are looking at fine motor and to be able to use voice if that's strong, it can be a good alternative to that um, as, as we uh, go along. But I also wanted to tie it to higher incidents because our kids with dyslexia, for instance, and all kids, if you put less on a screen, it's less overwhelming. So if you think about uh, opening up a newspaper, where do I start? It's crazy. But if I reduce the amount on a page, it just helps me to relax because it's not so overwhelming. And this is something the kids with dyslexia um, really, and the family really jumped into, but just another thought about why that's important. So uh, the last display setting that I wanna hit on is the night light. Um, probably not something you're gonna use in the classroom a lot, but I know these kids take their Chromebooks 
home and they hide in their rooms with their lights off like my teenagers do. And this will help reduce the eye strain when they're doing that. Whether or not it's good for them, I told them, don't do it. But, you know, they're going to do it. So. I wanted to make the comment, of, uh, yeah. I just put it in the chat. But again, as we think about the intersection of the therapist, it comes across all of our low and disability areas. And so from the work with kids with TBI, this is something you might want to consider because often that screen time, we've got to reduce the screen time. Um, and, and so some things that can minimize the drain on the eyes and the brain, uh, just consider that so many applications of these tools. Thank you, Chuck. Um, yes, I have the blue light filter on on my computer like all the time. It kind of, I find it, we have plenty of fluorescent lighting in the office and it gives me a little bit of a headache. I don't need more of it from my computer screen. So keyboards and text input options. So there are a ton of options here. So I'm just going to touch on a few of them. Um, there's an on-screen keyboard. So some of your kiddos have uh, a touch screen or tablet mode um, Chromebook. And so that virtual keyboard is very helpful. I know that some kids have the, those tactile feedback issues. And for some of them, that virtual keyboard might be the way to go because they don't have that clicky, clicky on the keyboard. I know some of the kiddos that my kids went to school with, they just they hated it. So that might be an option. Also, you can combine that with the highlighting to help focus on the keys that they're actually hitting. So if they have any issues, motor issues or anything like that, they can see what they're hitting on the virtual keyboard. So dictation, another personal favorite of mine, speech to text. This, um, I turned this on on my Chromebook to play around with it. Uh, and, and it's fantastic. Um, the word recognition, for me at least, was very good. And I think that I'm not a great typist. I know kids that are learning, kids that have fine motor issues, kids that don't know how to type, to kids that can't type. This speech to text is very helpful. Um, also, it really can cut down on that getting tired when you're typing. And frankly, I can speak way faster than I can type. So, I know that uh, I have a kiddo that has a really difficult time with writing in general. And we found that the speech to text was a much better input method for him. He was better able to think and speak through what he wanted to write. But for some reason, when he sat down in front of a keyboard, it's like his brain shut down. So this was very helpful for him. And Chandra, a comment or a question from Mary Ellen. Thanks for being here, Mary Ellen. Um, are there any suggestions for not having environmental interference with the dictation? And I know the first thing we'll think of is a noise canceling uh, headset and they don't have to be really expensive for that. But I wanted to say I had a, I did a little bit of a, a pilot a few years ago where I had everybody sitting around the table uh, to see how much it could they be accurate with the uh, noise canceling when other people were dictating at the same time. And it was amazingly um, accurate. And, you know, we think that people need to be in a room isolated. Well, they might if they're talking out loud and it's disturbing others, but from the standpoint of can it be canceled out, I think a good set of heads, headphones um, is the first place to start. So anybody who has other suggestions, um, feel free. You're so right. The, a, a good 
pair of noise canceling headphones and they have microphones that filter out background background noise. Very yes, good. Mary Ellen, the headset has a microphone as well. So uh, yes. yes, all of that built in. And I've had somebody doing construction outside my window, but nobody online was able to hear it. And if I was dictating, I mean, it's going to block all of that out. So yes. Yeah. So this has a built-in switch access in your Chromebook. Um, and I'm I'm not going to get into switches because we know that that's a whole other <laughs> a whole other uh, learning curve there. Um, but it does have that, so it works with scanning and switches, and so that's just built right in. And Brooke has a, a question. Yes. And, um, her question is, how sensitive is the Chromebook speech to text for kids who have speech impairments? And I, I mean, as far as the exact sensitivity, but I know in the past I've I've said, well, that might not be a good option for a kid but because they did have an impairment. And I used to demonstrate it for everybody. And I had a, a, a young man come up to me and say, I'd really like to try that. And he very difficult to understand. But, you know, you want that to be an exploration to see. Well, he was so darn determined that he was using it. And when he knew that it wasn't understanding him, he started to, you know, enunciate a little bit better. And I'm not going to say it happens for everybody, but he was able to use the speech to text successfully and his speech started getting better. So I would just say, don't ever uh, leave somebody out of, you know, whether it's a good tool for them or not, let them experiment with it. But how sensitive, I don't know. It, and if you've got somebody who has Ogcom, um, being able to use some of these tools for writing, uh, don't, don't, don't leave that out either. And, uh, feel free to add with that, Chandra. Sometimes I just have had experience with a student where it just comes into play here. No, your your answers are spot on. Yeah. Uh, so an interesting feature is called Sticky Keys. Uh, I was looking through these shortcuts in this menu, and there are three and four keys that you're supposed to hit all at the same time. Well, that can be difficult, especially if you have little hands or limited motor function. So this particular feature lets you hit one key at a time in order to access those shortcuts. So I'd love to hear how you guys think that those things will be helpful. Um, and then highlighting. And, and this might be one of my very favorites. And I showed it to my husband last night and he said, here's my computer, make this happen. <laughs> it's It allows you to customize the box that will show up around whatever it is that you're focused on. So you can change the color and and you can, like when you tab through a page, it'll highlight what you're on. Again, I know I mentioned the mouse thing. I have trouble finding my cursor as well. I, for some reason, it just gets lost on my screen. And so I'll tab through the screen and it'll highlight exactly where I'm at, what what uh, box I'm on. I, I absolutely love that one. Um. Yes, Deb, you're so right. Those many of these things do require some training, especially the speech to text and text to speech, those sorts of things. They do. They we're not just going to turn those on for kids and just be like, have at her. <laughs> it, they do. Well, and they still need to know what they want to write. And, you know, I've gone through and trained kids to speech to text and they still freeze when the microphone comes on because it's still hard to get the ideas out there. So sometimes a student might need a graphic organizer or something first, so that then whenever they start speaking it, um, their thoughts are a little bit clearer because it can be overwhelming. Absolutely. 
So then uh, the keyboard settings, again, there's like a ton of options here. So you can customize your keys so that um, a particular key is actually a different key. Maybe there's a, a key that a kid has trouble reaching. Um, you can change where that input is. You can change the language. And this was one that I discovered um, after my dyslexia workshop. Um, the input language you can change to say Spanish so they can type in Spanish into the computer. I thought that was brilliant. Um, we have custom. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say that I had a student one time where they were trying to use voice and this is a long time ago, but it would also apply to some of the Siri and those tools. But if I was trying to open a program on my desktop, for instance, and I was trying to say, open Microsoft Word. Well, for some kids, that's going to be a challenge. But we started calling it whatever they wanted to call it. So on the title of the folder of the program on the desktop, we just called it Bill or whatever. So then whenever I was trying to, I wasn't trying to say Microsoft Word, I just said open Bill. And so just thinking about some of the things that you can create, it was very easy to say Bill. Um, so just a fun thought. Thing. So it looks like we have a, some questions. What options are beneficial for one for tremors? So are you asking about just in general for like input? Yeah, yeah, what keyboard settings are helpful when um, there's repeat keys that are getting hit? Okay, so there there is a feature in there that I didn't talk about in here that has to do with repeat holding down a button. There are some settings in there where you can adjust the sensitivity and stuff. Uh, and it is in the it is in the keyboard settings. So I would I would tell you, yes, and and sticky keys, yes, so that they're not. Yeah, hitting, they can hit it one at a time. Um, I would go into the keyboard settings. It's all really very basic. So you could, you'll you be able to find it and see it. It's, um, I don't remember exactly what it's called, but it is in the keyboard settings. And, and uh, I realize a person with trimmers may also have a difficulty with speech. Could be just depending on where they're at, but it could be that using speech uh, to access things uh, or to, you know, just a different method of input may be a good way to go. Well, uh, and there is this um, custom spell check feature. Uh, it's like a custom dictionary, basically. So if you are trying to type a little bit less, you can go in there and change the words and what they pop up as in the spell check. So if we're kind of like typing shorthand, you could customize that. And then Crystal has a uh, comment or question. Uh, if they type in Spanish, is there a way for it to switch to English? And this is an area that I'm really interested in and in being able to support our multilingual learners um, and the translations back and forth. Uh, you may have an answer to this, Chandra, but I welcome anybody who's got some uh, good accessibility tips for um, multilingual learners because they need to be at our tables too. I don't have a great answer to that um, as far as built-in stuff. I think I will research it because I know that uh, you, Deb, are really into this translation thing right now. And so I will, I'll look into it and um, and if I can find an answer, I will throw it into the, the handouts folder. Maybe a specific... and if anybody else has an, um, any uh, supports or uh, resources for, for that, let us know. We have a reading pen that now you can read in different languages and it translates. But as far as on the, in Chromebook, we will look that up. Thank you. Yeah, for that. I'll find out. 
Um, and then last, the kiddos love their emojis, but you can turn that off. How do you get to the custom spell check? So that is in your keyboard and in text input options in the keyboard settings. And I have a Chromebook right in front of me. Uh, the custom spell check is under input settings, spelling and grammar check, customize spell check. So and Debbie, this is recorded, so you can follow that along. <laughs> that's right. And so Debbie asked about Google Translate. Um, and is that a tool that could be used? And I would say yes, that there's an application for that. In our yeah. conversations, we've had uh, we've had discussion about the accuracy of it. And, you know, maybe it gives the general gist, but maybe it gives something wrong that, that changes the meaning of it. Um, so Google Translate, yes, if you're using text to speech and speech, I could say speak it that way. And then um, a screen reader could read it back even in their own language. So I think that there's some tools that can help with that. The only um, the only piece that I've heard is, is it accurate? And so I'll let anybody speak to that. So in my last life as a project manager, I had a project in Mexico and I worked with a gentleman that he spoke English, but there was a lot of Spanish coming in, um, in our plans and communications. And I used Google Translate extensively to work that project. So it, it was pretty accurate it does take some context in order to translate properly. And I know we've been having a lot of conversations about the application of AI for translation, but whenever we've got somebody who's at that point of writing and needing to hear what they've written, uh, I'm not gonna say that AI is the best tool for that, uh, but for translation and accuracy, I'm just gonna throw out there that some people are experimenting with that. Yeah, it might be a good place to start. Well, and it might not be ap applicable, like I said, when it's a student's writing. It may be, uh, unless they're starting with AI. I, I don't know. There's lots of ins and outs and lots of factors. I don't want to confuse it, but um, lots of things about AI being used for translation. So our cursor and touchpad settings, again, there's a ton of these. We have automatic clicks where you can set it up so that when you hover over your mouse over an item and dwell, it will automatically click it for you. So you don't have to click it yourself. You can customize your mouse. I've touched on this a few times. So you can make it smaller or larger. You can change the color. You can create better visibility for your kiddos who have um, issues tracking it for whatever reason, visually, visual impairments. Uh, me, I just, I'm just weird. So I just need that bigger mouse that's highlighted. Um, the auto click, I, I didn't find an auto click on in Chrome. So just on the Chromebook. That's not to say there's not an option for it in an extension or something like that, but just built into it. I didn't find that. Um, you may also find that sort of a in a system setting in your computer because there are many options for accessibility features beyond just the Chromebook or the Chrome browser. So we can the, so the swipe pad uh, or the touch pad, sorry, for the Chromebook is, is uh, it's meant to increase productivity so that you don't have to separate your hand from the keyboard. Uh, for swipe navigation, this is, I mean, at least for me, this was a relatively new feature. Um, where you can use two fingers to go up or down or back or forth in your windows. You can turn this on and off. So 
if you have a kiddo that has trouble um, keeping their hands in one place, maybe uh, the swipe navigation is not something you want on. It is on uh, like by default. So maybe you want to turn it off. That could be a thing. It allows you to uh, use two fingers to navigate your, like your internet pages. So you can go back or forward. And then other touchpad settings will allow you to change whether you go up or down to navigate the page up and down. Um, with the kiddos, I I explained to them that if any of them ever played uh, video games, which I love, I love video games. <clears throat> I think Deb mentioned that in my bio. Um, if you play an airplane game, we all know, I think, that down is up and up is down. And so just for that um, cognitive function where you know, like everything can be the same. So including your scrolling, uh, you want up to be the same in all of your platforms. It just makes everything easier. So I recently changed my scroll wheel to reverse it so that it was the same as my touchpad. Very helpful. Um, and you can change the speed at which the touchpad, like the touchpad sensitivity. Um, and there's a couple of other things in there. So if you go faster across the touchpad, it'll go farther. So very interesting as far as fine motor. I jack those sensitivities way up so that I have to, I don't have to move my fingers hardly at all to get where I want to go. I like that. Uh, we have audio. So I know it looks like there's not a lot of features here, but they're pretty in-depth um, as far as the, the captions go. But the mono stereo sound. So that allows you to be able to hear all of the sound in one side. So if you have any sort of auditory issues or you only have one earbud in or one speaker, you're not going to miss any of the audio output. Uh, if you, for instance, my husband is, I swear, he's going deaf in one ear. <laughs> Maybe he's just ignoring me, but I think he's going deaf in one ear. Um, he's not going to miss anything if I put that on mono. He's going to hear everything in that one ear. So very helpful. Live captions and text settings. So this is where you can turn on auto-generating captions for videos that don't otherwise have captions. So you can use this throughout the Chromebook platform, not just on the internet. So I pulled up a recorded video that we did a month or so ago, and it didn't have captions built in, and it auto-generated these captions. You can use this for phone calls, for meetings, anything like that. And it you can, there's a, like a bunch of settings where you can customize the color, the background, white on black, black on white. You can put it over the video, up on top or below, whatever is comfortable. And then there was a bunch of languages available that you can download. So you would probably need to get IT involved in that, that language piece because it's a download. But really fun things to play with. I had kiddos turning on uh, Russian 
not sure that they knew how to read or speak Russian, but they thought it was funny. I've trained teachers as well, teachers and therapists, and they love to do the same thing. You might as well build in time for people to play with the voices because it's a universal. Yeah. I'm going to play. And with the with the kiddos at the workshop, I absolutely did that. Yeah. Well, and I want to make another comment here, too, about training the student. I, I, I noted that if we find something that works for a student, a certain display setup, of course, writing that down so we can have that as part of the setup on their device or whatever, but playing with it as part of the, the voices. But then when you come to a point where you're really training what you know works, um, I would suggest doing it in kind of a step-by-step -step to help the student learn a process. And I'm calling a student where we were trying to help them use a portable word processor, processor something we don't do anymore. But anyway, <laughs> the, uh, the instructional assistant was letting him have time to play with it to begin with before they got started. Well, we had to then go back and break the habit of 10 minutes of playing with the device because that's what he in his mind developed as part of the process. So I think just making sure you have that as you're training the student. And if you need visual supports along with that on the checklist, then there's ways to do that too. But playing with it and then getting serious with it um, and teaching it in a, like I said, in a process. I Thanks. did encourage the kids to take their Chromebooks home and play with them at home. Because there were so many things. Um, there were so there's so many options, you know, and and it it takes some time, and and they're older kids, of course, so it takes time for them to you know figure out what they like. And the other thing is, we presented to the parents and the educators as well. Our workshop we had some thirty plus kids, but then they each had two or three parents with them, so they were all learning the same thing. Now that doesn't mean a kid's going to go home and want to sit down and play with it with their parents. But at least they knew what the kids were learning. And, uh, you know, even the parents, we had them texting their spouse who was at work and saying, look at this tool. And it, so it's exciting. But just the parents and the family were part of those conversations, too. Yeah. So um, Chrome browser accessibility features. Again, I included a where are they so you can go in and find them. So moving from the Chromebook, uh, which is, you know, more of a classroom for the kiddos, these, this Chrome browser is something that, of course, we all use. I'm Pretty much all of us use it. So, and personally, we use it in our regular lives. These kiddos use it outside of school. And this is something that they're going to continue to use well into the future. So these, the browser has very similar features to the Chromebook. So I don't need to explain most of them to you because we've already talked about them. But you would go up into that little three dot menu. It's going to pull up a drop down. You're going to scroll all the way down to settings. And that's going to pop up a dialogue box. And on the left-hand side, near the bottom, it'll have accessibility. And that'll pop up your menu of features. So in there is live captions again. So I played with this and it was a little bit clunky. So I'm just going to warn you to start with. And it didn't quite function the way that I was expecting it to. So first of all, you're going to need just a tiny bit of patience because it takes a minute for it to kind of catch up with itself. But what I also discovered was that on my PC, there is a live caption option as well. And they function independently. So the live captions in your Chrome browser is going to work just in your Chrome browser. 
But if you have a PC, there is a live captions option also in your PC that will work with any video that you pop up, maybe that you have saved or something on your computer. There are languages, and I did have to download the language pack before the live captions would function. So again, this might be something that IT needs to be involved in if they're going to be using it. You can, again, change the size, the color, the background, uh, the font, those sorts of things to customize the, the captions to whatever works for you. But I really loved this particular shortcut was Windows Control L to turn it on and off. I know I didn't include a lot of shortcuts like I did for the kiddos, um, showed you where the shortcuts were, but this particular shortcut is something that I think I will use. And so I'm hoping it's helpful to you. So uh, they have the highlight on focus. So you can again use um, this highlight feature to track where you are in your web page and tab through. Now this one doesn't have quite the, it doesn't have the um, customization that your Chromebook does. Um, it will put a box up there, but you can't change the color or anything like that. So good to be aware of its limitations. Um, but I did turn it on on my particular browser and I do love it. So this one, this next one is interesting. It's an AI driven image description. Uh, I'm sure that Michael Cantino would have some comments on this particular one, but it's for screen readers. It is AI powered. It sends the image to Google and then kicks back a description for your screen reader to read. Now, if you go on Google's website and you look at this particular feature, it's going to tell you straight up that the AI description is never going to be as good as a human input description. So just to be aware, it might be helpful. It's definitely not going to give the whole picture. It may be inaccurate. So I'm sure that as time goes on, it will get better and better. But for now, just be aware that if you turn this on, it, it may have some bugs. And I think the other thing to remember is that if a person is putting alt text behind their images and their description as they're creating it, then you don't have to go out to AI uh, for the description. But if that person yeah. is doing that and, and you're using AI within the tool and letting it automatically create a description, what you're saying, Chandra, is absolutely true because it doesn't always pick out what I would think would be the important parts for somebody. Best but practice, yes, alt text. And if you don't know how to do alt text, I can I can give you some resources for that. Yeah, alt text, super important. Um, so swipe forward and backwards. This is similar to the touchpad setting on your Chromebook. It allows you to use two fingers to go back a page or forward a page. I was showing this again to my husband and he said, oh yeah, I know about that. I did it on accident and lost my page. <laughs> so if you don't know that that is a thing that you can do, um, be careful. <laughs> Make sure it's on or off or you know that it's on or off or you might lose your page <laughs> and not know how to get back to it. So the final thing uh, about the Chrome browser is that this is not the end of the features. And I'm not going to talk about them, but there are so many extensions. So many. 
Uh, I have a few on my Chrome browser. I have the Read and Write extension. Uh, and I have a free OCR <clears throat> extension called Copyfish. And I have that because the Chromebook came loaded with it. And so I thought I would try that out. Uh, but there's so, so, so many extensions. Um, and again, you your IT department would need to be involved in that, I'm sure, for whatever you wanted to add to a Chrome browser. But just so that you know, you're not limited to these few accessibility features. So here are some resources. These are all from the Google website, or the bottom one is their a YouTube playlist, which shows you how to use a lot of these features um, very simply. There's an accessibility quick guide, which I believe I've included in the handouts as well. But all of these links uh, will send you to more explanation. It'll give you visuals if you need them on how to use these features. So here's the discussion part. Um, if you guys have questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask the questions now. Um, but if you don't have any questions, I would ask, that you chime in and let us know, like, what's one of these features that you think you want to use immediately with your students or for yourself? And mo most importantly, I think if any of you guys have used these uh, successfully with students, please share. Because that is going to be the most helpful information, I think. I leave it to you guys. Oh, and I do see some questions in here. Um, are you able to save the transcript of the live caption? Yes, I believe so. I believe that in the Chromebook, it will save directly to your Chromebook and it never goes out to Google. So there's that privacy um, if you're doing meetings or phone calls. Uh, though I will say I have not done that. So I, I wouldn't be able to tell you how to do it, but I definitely can look into it. 100% uh, you can use all of these slides for anything you want. I work for the Oregon Technology Access Program and we fully believe in disseminating information because it's not useful otherwise. And I can give you the PowerPoint if you would like it. Um, thank you, Joy, for joining us. Are you able to use other browsers on a Chromebook? Uh, yes, you absolutely can. Um, again, you would have to go through your IT people, I'm sure. Uh, but you can download any apps that you can get normally on a normal computer. You can download all of those. For resources about apps and extensions, all right, Deb's got a, oh yeah, callscotland.org. They are a fantastic resource for all sorts of things, yeah. I discovered them fairly early on when I started working with you. Very great. Yes, hover click. That's great. Um, highlighting feature on CB to increase attention and engagement. Yes, uh, I 100% I love that highlighting feature. It's my favorite. And changing the color of the highlighting, you know, it has yeah. When we work with things like the old Erlen overlays and, uh, you know, certain color combinations, and I have had people who uh, on the screen, letters were dancing for them. And as soon as they got the right color, 
Uh, you can do that on a worksheet, of course, but you can do it on the screen. So as soon as they got the right color highlighting, it was like somehow the thing stopped dancing. I'm not going to say that's going to happen for everybody, but that's just the reason why we need to be um, experimenting uh, with the different settings to find what works and empower our students that way.